Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. I don't know, something just feels off today. Must be a Cincinnati Bengal kind of day. Oh. Also here, John Schnapp. Well, those guys can talk about sports. I was on a bender this weekend. That's when you combine <laughs> binge watching and on a bender. It's called a bender. I know it's spelled like binder, but it's not. It's bender. Also here, Mark Ellis. I went on a bender of watching football this weekend. And look, my Redskins lost. It's very disappointing. But God, you Bengals and Vikings fan, my heart goes out to you. I'm so sorry. Finkel forever, right, guys? Oh, that, <laughs> Finkel, that's laces out. out. Too soon? Laces Finkel. out. Um, all right, guys. Well, it's Monday. It is Monday, and before we get to our regular, regular uh, scheduled, uh, our, we have a bender it's of topics. One of those days. <laughs> uh, our our regular list of stories today. Something just dropped in Variety, and uh, Mark, why don't you take us through regarding Star Wars and the new Han Solo movie? Well, John, I'm a very tiny part of Jedi Council, so I'll take the lead <laughs> on this. Is that Variety reported this morning that they have a short list in hand for who's going to be playing Han Solo in the 2018 spinoff movie? And you look at these three handsome lads right there. They are some of the contenders we're going to be talking about this morning. That's Miles Teller, Ansel Elgort, and Dave Franco. Also on the list, Scott Eastwood, Logan Lerman, and I think the wild card in all this is, I believe his name is Blake Jenner from the upcoming uh, Richard Linklater movie, Everybody Wants Some. So, John, not only is this news that they have a short list from all the thousands of people they auditioned, they honed it down to a very tiny group that they're going to be screen testing very soon. Also, in this report, it's mentioned that while they, they're going to be in the new standalone Han Solo movie, this actually actor who plays Han Solo might have a small cameo in Rogue One, which is still going to be filming for another month. Uh, kind of like the way they're putting Spider-Man into Civil War. You might see Han Solo back on screen sooner than you thought. That is the part to me that feels weird yet right at the same time. Look, it's going to be weird for all of us. There's no getting around it. Unless they were doing a movie about a 14-year-old Han Solo, <laughs> it's going to be really weird for all of us seeing somebody else mm. you know, in that 70s space vest. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really weird for us. So the notion of before getting to his standalone movie, even if it's just for a minute, introducing us to him in Rogue One to give us a good year and a half to adjust our minds and get used to the idea that somebody other than Harrison Ford is playing Han Solo. That's not a bad idea. Now, clearly, he can't play a major role because we know Han Solo, that prior to the events of the original Star Wars movie, A New Hope, that he was never that involved with the Rebellion. We knew that already. So his role in this would have to be small and pretty much insignificant. But the notion of getting him in there so we can start to get used to the idea is pretty cool. I've... I'm, I still got to stick with my original pick, which is Logan Lerman. I really like the idea of Logan Lerman playing Han Solo at this point. But the other name that I hadn't really considered before is Scott Eastwood. Mm -hmm. Scott Eastwood, I think he could pull off a Han Solo and pretty well. Now, look, this list of actors they've given us, they're all tremendous talents. So all of them, I have no doubt, in the hands of Lord and Miller, will give us a terrific performance. And hopefully not just do a Harrison Ford impersonation, but rather do what Chris Pine did with Captain Kirk. He didn't try to do a William Shatner impersonation, and I'm sure that the temptation must have been there to do that. Instead, Chris Pine took that character and made it his own. And I think to some degree, while you'll still want some Han Solo mannerisms in there, because it's Han Solo, this new actor can't just do a Harrison Ford imitation. They've got to make it their own character. And I think all of these actors could do a good job I think my first two picks would be Lerman, though, and Eastwood. I don't know, Mark, what about you? Well, the big news to me is that we might see Chewbacca in Rogue One because he's hanging out with Han Solo. You know you might get yep. to see both of them on screen. I have no idea how he's going to factor into the Rogue One story, <laughs> but peeling back from that, even if that's not true, we still have to cope with the fact that we're going to be looking at a new Han Solo, and none of these names jump out to me as somebody that I'm dying to see play Han Solo right. because I don't think there's a human being on Earth that I want to see play Han Solo other than a young Harrison Ford again. If I can't get that, if I can't get the DeLorean in the time machine and bring him back to 2018 to make this movie, 
Uh, I the Jenner kid is very interesting to me because if he's in Everybody Wants Some and he knocks that out of the park, I haven't seen the movie. I don't know if the producers have seen his performance in that. You also have Jack Rayner from Macbeth, who I think is another yeah. wild card. Yep. And you also have the kid from Brooklyn. Out of all these names I'm looking at, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go off book and I'm gonna say Jenner's my first one. And then Ansel Elgort or Logan Lerman can tie for second because mm. Elgort's a guy from The Fault in Our Stars, amongst other projects. He brings a little bit of charm and personality to his roles. Yes, he does. And I yep. think that he would be the best Han Solo. I think Miles Teller is a guy who's really stretched his bounds as an actor. You mean and like Mr. Fantastic? I, like, <laughs> <is that? laughs> Bing bong. Sing. It, you know, if Michael B. Jordan got over that so fast, and poor Miles Teller has just, he hasn't had a movie since Fantastic Four, so you hope he recovers from it. Being Han Solo would be a great way to do it. I just, I, I don't love him for it as much as I would love, I think, Elgort. I'm going to go with Franco. I think he's the best out of all the picks. Why? Is because he's got that natural charm that none of these other actors, at least to me, I've seen in, in any what they do, they don't have that twinkle that Harrison Ford had as Han Solo in A New Hope. And Franco's got it. So, you know, regardless of what he's it's been kind in of an before, X factor sort yeah, of I think he it, yeah. I think in like out of all those people, I mean, I like Logan Lerman. I like all of the picks, except, yeah, a couple of them are weird. But Franco to me was like when I first heard it, I was like, what a weird decision. And then just thinking about it like, the last five minutes I was like, that's a really cool, weird way to go. But I think it almost feels natural. Like he's got that kind of devil may care attitude plus he's old enough where i wouldn't feel weird about seeing him in rogue one because rogue one is supposed to be very close to like what whatever maybe a year apart from the first episode of a new hope i don't know how they're going to tie it in year wise or they're stealing the plans of the death star you know they're, i don't know what how they're gonna tie i just don't it all know together. when you run into han solo during that time frame and 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 again yeah. there there's so much yet to be written for for even rogue one but like it, it this seems like a brutal smaller war movie with a right. political thriller aspect so i'm not sure where a han solo rogue spice smuggler is going to figure into that right. i'm sure they'll find a good way to tell us a story but off the top of my head i'm just not sure that makes sense yet i don't i would hope that they don't try to squeeze him into rogue one and just let rogue one be what it is but as far as a, so, a solo solo film i liked i would like to see them deal with the kessel run that would mm -hmm. be great even if they just started it out and he's doing the kessel run that would be like i'm in so you see the crawl text then it pans down to space and it's then, like boom, yes. that's yes. Kessel yeah. run. you know here's here's the i honestly if it's a small inconsequential part like hey look at some point in order to make this plan work one of the 30 moving pieces is we need this thing smuggled over there and they run into the smuggler they have a 30 second who happens to be Han Solo they have a 30 second conversation right. he goes and does the job it actually would fit in as long as they treat it right like that I actually think the most talented actor out of all this group is probably Miles Teller I mm -hmm. think it when you look at the full range it's probably Miles Teller I just don't see him as the fit I just don't see him as now. Don't get me wrong. If Lord Miller go, no, 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 he's. We think with his talent, we can make it work. I'll go. Okay, great. Let's see it happen. The one name I completely wrote off this list was Dave Franco. You've changed my mind. Still not my number one, but it, it, he might now be in my top three because now the way you're describing, I can kind of see it. All right, let's get on with our first official topic of the day. All right, it's Monday, which means it's time for our weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one for the fourth week in a row is Star Wars The Force Awakens, making an additional $41.6 million. The Force Awakens also climbed past Jurassic World on the worldwide all-time box office list into the number three spot with a total of $1.73 billion. Now only Titanic with $2.18 billion and Avatar with $2.78 billion are in front of it. Coming in second place this weekend is the new Leonardo DiCaprio film, The Revenant, bringing in $38 million. In third spot is the Will Ferrell, Mark Wahlberg comedy, Daddy's Home, making an additional $15 million to bring its domestic total up to over $116 million. In the fourth position is the new horror film, The Forest, making $13.1 million. And rounding out the top five is the Tina Fey, Amy Poehler comedy, Sisters, making over $7 million. John, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? Uh, obviously, Star Wars is staying number one for the fourth. But The Revenant came a lot closer than I thought. Yeah. Like, it was leading in the in Friday and the Saturday numbers, and then it got passed by just like $3 million. Revenant did very good. But the other thing is this that really stands out to me. Daddy's Home, if you had told me 
uh, four weeks ago that, hey, Daddy's Home's going to open a couple weeks. It's still going to be against Star Wars in its prime right now. All that kind of stuff. And Daddy's Home is going to make north of $115 million. I'd say, man, that's really optimistic, but they have. They've crossed over $115 million. That's impressive. The Forest doing over $13 million is also impressive to me. I didn't think it was good fare that well. And Sister stays in the top five for the fourth week in a row. It's almost made $75 million, all while going against Star Wars. So to me, that is impressive. The other thing, obviously, Star Wars now becomes the number three all-time box office thing. And it's, it's, I'm going to call it right now. Star Wars does not catch Avatar. I've been saying it the whole time. I think now that it's opened in China, we've seen the numbers that it's opened up in China with. It's now released everywhere it's releasing. And it is still over $1 billion behind Avatar. I'm calling it. The race is done. It's not going to catch Avatar. Still has a chance of catching uh, Titanic, though. So let's keep an eye on that. Some really impressive stuff here. Anyway, Schnepp, what stands out to you? Here's a question. If The Force Awakens like comes out next year as a special edition, like how Lucas would tinker with stuff, <laughs> it's like it, that's kind of double dipping the audience. It but counts. People, it counts. People yeah. would go see it. We added this special preview Rogue One or some weird, you know, <laughs> extra sweaty thing. I'm sure they'll do it. We put the new Han Solo yeah. to yeah. narrate this yeah. movie. He'll so, be doing DVD yeah. commentary on Force Awakens. We changed a couple things. We put the orange Yoda in at the beginning. It's a whole bunch of weird stuff. Uh, some people orange are floating Yoda who weren't floating earlier earlier um yeah what stands out to me is definitely the revenant like kicking it really hard almost overtaking star wars for number one yeah uh and uh the the comedies are still those two comedies are have a great stranglehold on the top five i mean sisters has been consistently in the top five and it, four it, weeks yeah it, it shows you that if make sure if you're coming out with a comedy open against star wars because you will get all that flow over mm -hmm. you'll get all that because that's what's happening people are going to the theater maybe star wars was sold out this at the time that they wanted to go see it they'll say oh let's see this movie and then we'll see the later uh, you know star wars or whatever it's working so i think that's what sticks out and i i predict that the forests a sequel to The Forest will be happening. <laughs> <laughs> Mark? Yeah, it, if you want to counter-program against Star Wars, you open a comedy with big stars in it with Tina, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, or Will Ferrell, Mark Wahlberg. You can do big business, but the big story to me is The Revenant. I mean, The Revenant only lost to Star Wars by $3 million. So another cold-weather team like the Vikings, <laughs> all you needed was a field goal, The Revenant, and you just couldn't <laughs> hit it when you had to do it. But, you know, you look at The Forest, and that's a very impressive number, $13 million. I didn't even know this movie was coming out, and allegedly that's part of my job to know this stuff. I'm not very good at my job, and I acknowledge that, but not knowing that The Forest was coming out and that it made $13 million. Holy crap, the studio's got to be thrilled about that. Yeah, they shot out in a forest. It was free. They had a camera. They paid the actress. They're like, what set do we even have? Maybe the beginning, somebody's kitchen, and then the rest of it's out in nature. Fog is free. They're like, just make just sleep again. A fog's almost coming. Everything was free. So clearly somebody's studio apartment for all the other That's scenes. Right. I think, too, and this is unfortunate, but I think we'd be remiss not to mention that not in the top five, despite going wide release and all this kind of stuff, was Hateful Eight. Mm -hmm. uh, Hateful Eight only pulling in $6.3 million after going into wide release and adding how many more theaters? Adding almost 500 additional theaters on top of the 2,000 mm -hmm. additional theaters from last week. It was out in how many theaters now? Almost 3,000 theaters. Wow. Um, and if you, I remember a good debate that me and a friend of mine had a, a few months ago about whether Revenant or Hateful Eight will do better at the box office. And we were having a discussion. I ended up agreeing with him. I started with the Revenant, but then I, he convinced me that, you know, look at the success of Django Unchained and how much money that made. He convinced me that Hateful Eight would kind of probably trump Revenant. And not the case. Uh, for whatever reason, something about this marketing campaign has not clicked with the audience. Right. I don't know. And I don't know if it was this misguided, and I'll call it misguided, um, emphasis they want to put on, we're doing the 70 millimeter. Nobody cares. <laughs> no one cares, Quentin. Mm -hmm. Nobody cared. Um, so I don't know if it was that, but I don't really think that was the well, I reason. Think, you know the biggest reason? Hateful Eight does not have a realistic bear attack. <laughs> I mean, Revenant will mess you up. This is, not, this is in the trailer, so it's not a spoiler. So but that's relax. not Quentin's fault. Quentin told the wine scenes, look, I really, I need extra money yeah. for this really good I bear. I got this bear scene. It overtakes <laughs> Kurt Russell in the beginning. They're fighting. They're like, no. They said no. The original name of the movie was The Honey Loving Nine, and then they had to cut it down. <laughs> 
to Hateful Eight, <laughs> the true. Marmalade <laughs> Enthusiastic <laughs> Nine, and yeah. they had to get rid of it. But but in all seriousness, like I, I think it's safe to say Hateful Eight. Let's, it's not a flop. Somebody asked last week, is right. Hateful Eight a flop? No, the, the Hateful Eight as a motion picture in Hollywood, while Star Wars is out, has already made forty-one million dollars. It does not qualify as a flop, especially when you consider it's it's only cost about forty-five million dollars to make. It will probably end up losing a little bit of money, but it's by no means a flop. But I think it is safe to say it's a disappointment, especially when you consider Quentin's last movie, Django Unchained, which was so beloved and did so well financially. Uh, why have people not been interested in The Hateful Eight? I think a lot of it has to do with the critical reception. While it was very good for Hateful Eight, it's still on Rotten Tomatoes. It's not quite as high as you might expect a Tarantino movie around this time of year. And everybody is thinking The Revenant might be positioning itself for a great award season. We've already seen some of that fallout. And so people want to go see that. Plus, when you have DiCaprio and you have Tom Hardy and Inaratu all doing a film together in such a right. unique style of movie, these were two movies that were being released and part of that marketing campaign campaign was how unique the filmmaking process was and I think people decided that they would rather see The Revenant and see how that movie was made versus The Hateful Eight. Yeah, they both take place in the snow so people are like which snow movie are we going to see? You can't see too many cold yeah, weather movies. It's one we just other. saw Star Wars. Right. Yeah. That had some snow, snow in it. So people were snowed out. People were totally snowed out. One of the other things that I'm glad you brought up the 70 millimeter because I think that might have been not a, something that detracted people from it as opposed to made people. I think uh, people were, maybe people were confused because so many people are not cinephiles. Like Quentin's like, we're doing it in 70 millimeter. A lot of people don't even know what 70 millimeter is. Unfortunately, right. it's the mm -hmm. truth. You may have alienated them a little I, that's bit. That's what I'm saying. I think that, that oh, so only, oh, you can only see it in 70 millimeter. Well, it's not playing in 70 millimeter where I live. It's playing right there. It's just not in 70 millimeter. So it puts that barrier in people's minds. Well, I, I want to wait till I get to see that in 70. So I'm going to see this other snow movie with the bear. So I, I, you know what I mean? I'm just like, <laughs> I think something locked in with people with the 70 and I can't see it. So I'm not going to see it at all. It's one of those things. Have you guys seen that meme of it's it's two pictures at the top? It's uh, it's Leo DiCaprio sitting at the at the Academy Awards with a disappointed look on his face, and underneath is a picture of the bear holding the Oscar. <laughs> I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. All right, what's next? On March 25th, the highly anticipated Batman vs Superman finally hits theaters, and this weekend a new TV spot was released showing us a little Batmobile vs Superman action, and the Batmobile didn't fare too well. Shneb, <laughs> what do you think of the new Batman vs Superman TV spot? Man, I absolutely love this. And I got to say this for all the haters online, because there's so many of these people are complaining. How come he's got the changed voice without wearing the bat armor? Or how come he only says that one thing, you'll bleed? It's like, remember, it's a trailer. They probably have a little bit of a back and forth conversation before Batman says that, you know, fam now famous line. And he, Superman takes off. He's like, you will. I thought that was cool. I was like, awesome. We finally see where that line comes from. It seems like a perfect way. It's probably the maybe their first or second time they're actually meeting. I thought it set the, the tone of Batman fighting or versus Superman great. And I think I think what they're doing right now is they're like, look, maybe people didn't really respond too well to that second trailer. People got a little weird about the the frog doomsday and a bunch of other <laughs> you know the other shots. He's a turtle. That, the Crap. things that the didn't doomsday. yeah the things that didn't work out too well. They're like, hey, work on the special effects, redo that. We're gonna fix the you know. So that, I think that's what they're doing. They're like. This movie is going to be amazing. I've, I, I cannot doubt that. I cannot doubt that everything I've seen, even though there's certain things like Eisenberg, the way he's playing Lex Luthor, we're both of the same thought that, you know, it's a mask. We're, yeah. we're praying and hoping it's a mask and there's something way better underneath. So I love the trailer. I loved it. Yeah, I, I, I look, it's what what is happening because there was actually a second TV spot that we're not really talking about because all it was, there was no new footage in it. It was just recuts. But even that second spot was just Bruce showing up the party, interviewing with Clark, and Lex shows up. He did have one extra line. He was like, well, that's not exactly how it goes down. Son, 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 son yeah, something like that. Yeah. So that was an extra line in there. But the point is the two TV spots that got released, and especially this one, it showed that Warner, the, the marketing department at any rate at Warner Brothers, have not been deaf. Mm -hmm. They have been listening. Yeah. They listened to the complaints that everybody had coming out of the second trailer because that first trailer was so damn good. Uh, best trailer of, of 2015 to me. And what they've done is, they say, you know what? Let's pull back. Let's put all the emphasis back on Batman versus Superman where it should have been the whole damn time and expanded a little bit later. I 
love this spot. Because let's say I want to kick your ass, right? And I'm really mad at Mark, (laughs) and I want to kick his ass. And I see him in the streets of Burbank, and I decide, you know what? Screw this idiot. I'm going to run him down, which I would never do. But... (laughs) So I hit the gas of the car and I run into him and my car bounces off him like a freaking ping pong ball. Just bounces off him. I am taking a different tone with Mark Ellis at that point. At that point, I'm like, I'm so sorry, sir. Uh, nope, you mm-hmm. mean that nobody, you're the greatest thing ever, Mark Ellis. That's the tone I would take. Screw that, what does Batman do? You're gonna bleed. <laughs> I just, he just bounced his car off him and he's still so badass. He's like talking trash to his face. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. I'm like, just, I love that scene so much. And he knows he can still hear him when Superman takes totally. off. Totally. You will. Like, yeah. he knows he can still You're hear him. You're super hearing, yo. You know? <laughs> he's still talking smack. Yeah. I loved it. I was grinning from ear to ear. And I went back. Like, I saw it on TV at first because I was watching the playoffs. And then I immediately grabbed my laptop. I started looking up this spot yeah. and watching it over and over again. Totally. It brought back that enthusiasm that yeah. I had after watching that comic. It's that trailer. epic face-off. When you yes. see them silently standing there in that very first trailer, that's the payoff is that the scene that we just saw in that commercial. Oh, I love it. Anyway, Mark, you saw the spot. It's a fun little fact for you kids at home is every time I leave the studio and I'm driving away, I see Campy running after me. You will! (laughs) I'm like, what is he? He's doing it again today. I love that spot we're talking about. I like the other ones, and I was a little... I wasn't disappointed. That's the wrong word, but it's like I, I... this, these trailers weren't made for me. They weren't made for people who ha- who loved the Comic-Con trailer and saw the second trailer. These trailers were made for an audience that might not be as aware as we all are that this movie is being released. This is for football fans who are watching the playoffs and then see this like, oh my God, Batman's fighting Superman. You notice the tone, the dark, gritty tone of that <laughs> spot in particular. That's yeah. going to really appeal to NFL fans. They didn't put anything else in there. They didn't need anything. You didn't need one Wonder Woman or Doomsday or anybody else in there, you didn't even need that other spot. The Lex Luthor spot to me didn't sell the movie as well as I hoped it would. Um, but I, I still like that scene, and I think that Jesse Eisenberg is going to be a great Lex Luthor. It's an important scene. I get that because it's Bruce Wayne and it's Clark Kent, and to the viewers sitting back on their couch watching football, it's like, oh my god, oh that's oh, I get it now. I want to see this movie. The other trailer, that spot, did a great job of selling the movie. The other one was 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 good. Yeah, you know, when I saw. When that spot was starting, you see the Batmobile racing towards Superman. In the, you know, your head instantly plays out a whole bunch of scenarios. I think, mm-hmm. okay, the car's gonna hit him, but it's gonna like knock him back by like forty feet. But he doesn't even go off his feet. He's just gonna slide to a stop and then come walking right back to the car. And I thought, oh, I hope they don't do that. And then the Batmobile <laughs> hits him, bounces right <laughs> off of him. They didn't compromise the vulnerability of Superman in the scene at all. They didn't compromise the badassness of Batman mm-hmm. at all. Perfect spot. Totally perfect spot. All right, folks, that brings us to the portion of our show called Buy and Sell. Here's how it works in front of Ashley. She's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? The first major trailer for the upcoming Matthew McConaughey Civil War film, The Free State of Jones, has hit the web. During the Civil War, a Southern farmer, played by Matthew McConaughey, joins forces with a group of slaves to lead a rebellion against the Confederacy. The Free State of Jones opens in theaters on May 13th. Mark Byers saw this trailer for The Free State of Jones. Huge buy for me. I was aware this movie was coming out, then I actually saw a TV ad for it too when I was watching uh, sports yesterday. And I was like, oh God, is that trailer out? Watching the trailer, I am locked into this movie now, man. McConaughey looks like he gives another great performance at speech that he's giving. He's just inspiring everybody based on a true story, I believe. This movie looks like, I don't know that it's going to be an Oscar contender because it's coming out so early in the year. I don't know that they're positioning it to be that kind of movie, but this is definitely something I want to see. Huge buy for me. I, I've been looking forward to this ever since I heard about mm-hmm. the uh, uh, the synopsis of the film. It sounded fascinating. I love seeing Matthew McConaughey taking on a role like this. And I, I mean, right from the beginning when, you know, when the one dude says he died with honor, he says, nah, he just died. And I'm like... I'm in. It had me hooked. Mm-hmm. It felt good. It felt like it's going to have a little bit more action. Now, this is based on a true story. How historically accurate it will be, that that term is very loose. Mm-hmm. Based on a true story can be very loose. But still, it, it looked engaging to me. So I cannot wait to see a big buy for me. Love the trailer. Yeah, it's a giant buy for me, too. I thought the trailer was fantastic. I love that they showed a lot of different scenes from the film, but I didn't feel like they were ruining the story. Like, you get the general gist. You're like, all right, he's in, he's in on this war family trauma leaves the war creates this you know 
this free state, this free area, and then he's got to fight everybody. So that's kind of the general idea. But within that, you see all this different, all this like him arming the women and just like certain things like that. Like I want to know who he's taken out in that church. And obviously got a gun. <laughs> he's blown off. He's capping somebody's dome. Who is it? We have to wait until we probably see the movie. Colin Firth. Yeah, it's probably Colin Firth. <laughs> it's Jonestown massacre. Everyone's drinking the Kool Aid. They get in a time machine. I don't know what's going to happen in the film, but I'm I'm buying it. I can't wait to see this. And movie. you know, it did such a great job of like showing the viewer that it's going to be action packed, but it's also going to have a like dramatic emotional side as yeah. well. It's not yeah. just like Die Hard back in time. This is going to be right. a movie that's probably going to impact you here and here. All right, what's next? Last night, the annual Golden Globe Awards were handed out. Some of the key winners were The Revenant, which won Best Picture Drama. The Martian won Best Picture Musical or Comedy. Matt Damon won Best Actor in a Musical or Comedy. While Leonardo DiCaprio won Best Actor in a Drama. Best Actress in a Musical or Comedy went to Jennifer Lawrence for Joy. Best Actress in a Drama went to Brie Larson for Room. Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture went to Sylvester Stallone in Creed. And Best Supporting Actress in a Motion Picture went to Kate Winslet and Steve Jobs. John, do you buy or sell the results for this year's Golden Globe Awards? I'm still not sure how either The Martian nor Joy qualify as a musical Seriously. or comedy. But whatever, <laughs> let's let's put that aside. Um, entertaining show. I mean, Ricky Gervais gave some great lines during the during the, the broadcast sure nice to see Sylvester Stallone getting some uh, accolades for his performance uh, of course in Creed I thought that was great feel good for Leonardo DiCaprio uh, ultimately these are meaningless awards uh, I mean so that's as Ricky Gervais uh, pointed out yeah, multiple Ricky times. The, the Golden Globes are completely meaningless but it's nice to see and, and honestly look I've got and I honestly have no qualms with any of the things that they picked would I have picked a Revenant over Spotlight no but I have no qualms with the Revenant getting that. I have no qualms with Leo, Nar Leo getting that one actor award. I have no, at least half of the best actor award, and Matt Damon got the other half of the best actor <laughs> award, I suppose. It's weird how that works. But uh, but no, like, no problems with any of the winners of the list. What about you, Schnapp? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I can't even bring myself to watch the Golden Globes anymore because it's such a farce. It's not real. It's like it's people are just going there for the governor's ball, just a party and <laughs> mingles. It's awesome for stars. It's free night of drinking and it's like, you know, rubbing elbows and stuff like that. But, you know, like I agree, it's like, you know, uh, The Martian is not a comedy. Trainwreck is a comedy. The Night Before <laughs> is a comedy. The Martian is not a comedy. I think, you know, they're really p expanding the bubble and it blew hey, up there were a couple yesterday. times that we laughed in the movie. Right. That means it's a comedy. Well, well, hey, Matt Damon is really funny, isn't he? <laughs> Who are these foreign press people and why are they insane? Why don't you get all 60 or 70 of them in a room and teach them what comedy is? So maybe next year we won't have this insanity. I mean, it's like I'll watch the collected clips of Ricky Gervais ripping on people sometime on YouTube later today. But to this point, for me, it's not even it's not even an award show anymore. It's a joke. I think you can take some of the awards seriously uh, because, in, as, as indicators as to how much people like those movies this year, but you're right. I mean, it's a farce, and I love Ridley Scott. As soon as he grabbed the Golden Globe for The Martian, the first thing he said, he had some line about how, yeah, I guess it's a comedy, kind of. Like, it was yeah. funny to make fun of that. And, uh, yeah, and, and I like seeing Matt Damon get some sort of recognition because I thought he was amazing in The Martian. That, that, that award category, it does feel like the junior varsity of the other movies. Like, mm -hmm. ah, well, we couldn't get you in this one, but, hey, here's another award for you. Right. It's it's just as heavy as the other one you would have won. So I love seeing I love seeing the Revenant win. I thought that was I thought that was awesome. Spotlight's a movie I'm a big fan of, but mm -hmm. the Revenant just blew me away so hard that I love seeing the, uh, the director and Aratsu and DiCaprio and everybody that was involved in that getting a piece of that pie. Um, my Ricky Gervais was great. I thought he was awesome. The Mel Gibson thing really cracked me up. Jim Carrey presenting was so funny when he came on. He was talking about how he's a two-time Golden Globe winner. It was hysterical <laughs> to watch that. I love seeing Tom Hanks present Denzel Washington with the Cecil B. DeMille Award. I thought Which that was a really cool moment. Which is the one award of the Golden Globes I actually really respect and I do like and I, I think right, they, right. they get and they generally get that one right mm -hmm. every year And I'm too. glad they called out some people. Like I totally agree that Brie Larson was incredible in Room. I'm not disagreeing that any of these people don't deserve awards but i think when you say like jennifer lawrence for best comedy joy it's like it's just a head scratch yeah it's like best actress in a comedy it's not a comedy martian is not a comedy it's a, it's infuriating so to me if like i was really scott and got this i would have thrown it <laughs> like what the hell did you who are you people and then everyone rips off their mask and goes oh or whatever it's all aliens got to put the shades on you it's just like, took this so to a whole different yeah, level like, oh my god i know what the, I know what the golden globes are now what are they i see you 
you. That's what it is to me, man. <laughs> did you just turn the Golden Globes into they live? Yes, yes he I did. did. He's Roddy Roddy. He's Chandler wow. Roddy Piper. You should get a Golden Globe. <laughs> I'm all out of Golden Globes. <laughs> all right, what's speak. next? We've known for some time now that multiple Academy Award winning actress Kate Blanchett was in talks for a role in the upcoming Thor Ragnarok film, but now we may know the role she may be playing. In a report on Entertainment Tonight, they interviewed actor Mark Ruffalo, who said the following, I'm so thrilled I saw her at the governor's banquet here and heard that maybe she was circling. They were talking to her about the part, so I ran up to her and I was like, please, please, please make this work. She's just one of the best and to have her play a baddie is going to be really exciting. Schnapp, would you buy or sell Kate Blanchett as a villain in the next Thor movie? I, I, it threw me for a minute. Why is Ruffalo getting all sweaty? And then I was like, oh, because he's the Hulk and he's in this movie. <laughs> yeah. I was like, can you please be in the movie with me? I love you. Because who doesn't love Kate Blanchett? She's amazing. Um, She's one of those actresses that is like all film is subjective. Absolutely, it is. But if somebody comes up to, ever comes up to me and says, "I don't find Kate Blanchett that good," I'm just like, I will never. I've just tuned you out. <laughs> right, There's no their, listening to you. Their opinion was like, "Yeah, they're like a 95. They instantly went to like 35. <laughs> Knuckle dragging. They're like somewhat ape-like. Put them in a corner. Give them some food in a little trough. They don't understand what it is to be an actor. Or I don't really like Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Do you bleed? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> To the moon! <laughs> yeah. Kate Blanchett can do no wrong. Even in Truth, which I didn't think was a good movie, she's good in it. So it's like, she does, I, I want her to be hella so bad. And if she's not, I'll take Enchantress. I just want her to be in this film. So yeah, I agree with Ruffalo. Yeah, and look at who, what villain she's been able to pull off in the past. Like she was so good in Cinderella. She she damn near stole that entire oh my movie gosh, from she me was so good as the wicked stepmother. So yeah, having her play a bad guy in this universe, this franchise, Thor, it's going to be such a boon to that movie. It's already exciting that you get so much Hulk in Thor Ragnarok, which mm. we expect. Having her be in there too, it, it's it's now Marvel. What's the one complaint that people have had about Marvel movies is the villains just don't quite match up to what we thought they might be. This could change a lot of that. Mm. Yeah, and it's funny. It's I think probably Mark Ruffalo's phone started ringing as soon as he said that about Batty because they've been trying to keep that under wraps. Like she right. was even on, I think it was Kimmel. Mm -hmm. I think she was on Kimmel recently and Kimmel directly asked her, so who are you playing? She goes, and she made a joke. She goes, well, you know, they said that Chris Hemsworth couldn't come back so they needed somebody to play her. <laughs> for him. They, they were playing it really close to the vest and then all of a sudden in a half-drunken kind of interview caught somewhere on a red carpet, oh, I can't wait for her to play the Batty. Oh! And he just know oh. what those people are calling. So... Mark has probably got a really long day in front of him today. Huh. But for her to play the villain would be insane. Like, other than Meryl Streep, you could make an argument that Kate Blanchett is the greatest actress of our generation mm -hmm. that we're going to see in this era. Um, and so to have her added to a movie like this to play a villainous role, that would just be spectacular. So, yeah, huge buy. All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, if you're watching us live, and there are thousands of you watching us live right now, I'm going to let you know they're going to save a few minutes at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live right now, you can fire some Twitter questions live to us at Collider Video. Make sure you're following us on Twitter as well and tweet in some questions, and Ashley will pick out some at the end of the show. But for now, let's get to the mailbag. So Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Monica D. writes, I read the horrible news this morning about the passing of David Bowie. I grew up listening to his music, as did my older brother and sister. A lot of people forget that he also appeared in a lot of movies. I was wondering what you will remember him most for in his acting career. You know, it's 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 really unfortunate for several reasons because when I first heard this morning about David Bowie passing, I didn't believe it because there was a uh, David Bowie dies uh, fake story like five months ago or oh, six okay. months ago or something like that uh, that it came out and it was totally not true. And then this came out today and again, I just kind of wrote it off because I didn't even know he was sick. I didn't know. And so then when I heard he died, that's really unfortunate. And, you know, a lot of reading around on the Internet today, a lot of people just really celebrating mm -hmm. uh, the, the music and the career of David Bowie. So if you're going to ask me what now, look, he's done some very key things. Obviously, most people will remember him for Labyrinth. Absolutely. And this is just my bias. But the greatest moment of happiness and joy David Bowie brought to me in his on-screen acting career. <clears throat> and it, this is going to seem weird because it's so little, but was his cameo in Zoolander when <laughs> when they're about to have their walk off 
Bowie, you have to understand how perfectly Bowie executed this. And they go, all right, who's going to judge this sucker? And just stepping dramatically out of the shadows, they I believe I might be of some assistance. <laughs> and it's David Bowie. And even just without lines afterwards, the constantly going back to him in his like judge's chair is like a big throne and him judging this walk off was hilarious. I don't know at this point. If I had heard rumors that he might have been cameoing again in the second Zoolander, obviously I'd, now that casts a lot of doubt on that or whether that's the case. But, um, yeah, the passing of David Bowie, very sad. Mark, what do you remember? The yeah, I mean, this the, the statement on my shirt, I believe it is true uh, for a very select few people, and David Bowie would definitely be one of those for me. His musical career was a huge influence on me, as well as his performances on screen. I love seeing him in The Prestige because I didn't know that he was in it when I got it on Netflix or however I read right. it. It might have been <clears throat> one of my last rentals at Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Is I popped it in and seeing him pop, I'm like, oh, sweet. I love David Bowie because he played also not one, but two very famous historical figures. He was Andy Warhol in Basquiat mm -hmm. and was tremendous. And he played Punch's pilot in The Last Temptation of Christ. Like, how, how versatile can this guy possibly be? You look at how versatile he was in his music career, and that's like enough for everybody. And then how good he was on screen. And obviously, as a kid growing up around that generation, Labyrinth, I love seeing him as the Goblin King. So it's a huge loss for artists in general for that community. It's, it's a huge loss for planet Earth. Schnapp, what do you think about? Yeah, devastating news. True legend. Um, incredible creative talent. You Sometimes you have people that are with you since you're born and you're like, they'll never die. And it's a bummer. Uh, the Man Who Fell to Earth for me, Nicholas Rogue's film, a science yeah. fiction film that <laughs> Bowie is the main star of. Love that film. It's a really unique and strange creative film. And it emphasizes the creativity that, that is and was David Bowie. So to me, that's my favorite film that he was in. I love that sequence. He played him also playing another historical figure, figure Tesla, of just him walking with electricity exploding right. all around him. <laughs> An amazing entrance. Uh, and uh, yeah, David Bowie's music. If you're not familiar with it, do yourself a favor. Check out Ziggy Stardust, Spiders of Mars. Check out David Bowie. Check out Tin Machine. Check out everything he's ever done. Listen to Low. Listen to Heroes. The Check guy, out Diamond Dogs, too. Diamond, Diamond Dogs, Dogs is, is probably my favorite Bowie album. It doesn't mm -hmm. get mentioned with the greats of all time, but right. you got Rebel Rebel on there. You got 1984. That's a great You've cut. got Let's Dance. He went through so many different phases of music and was so experimental, he was never going to get pegged. If you're like, oh, this is the David Bowie sound. No, it's now it's this. Mm -hmm. He was a true artist, and he'll be missed. Well, that's, that's one of the things a lot of people forget about with David Bowie was he was a true artist. He took the medium and he explored it. Every album was an exploration of a different corner, of a different room, of a different floor of this musical house that he had built over his career. And you're right, you were never able to peg him down in that. And so he gave us a lot of diversity, and you know he gave us a couple of very memorable film roles as well, and he will be missed. All right, what's next? Mark Harlan writes, is it possible that Star Wars Episode Eight could be a prequel like Indiana Jones? and the Temple of Doom. The Force Awakens has so many unanswered questions, or maybe episode eight will start with a huge flashback scene. Well, I don't think there's any chance in hell that it'll be a prequel to it. It's that there's a reason why they're numbering it sequentially. This is episode eight, this is the next part. But what you said in the last part of that question there, that's possible. Remember, in the one Lord of the Rings film, I can't remember if it was The Two Towers or if it was Return of the King, the movie starts with a brief five, six minute flashback scene to the origins of Gollum. So just like That's an opening right. scene right. that flashes back to Andy Serkis sit fishing with his little hobbit mm -hmm. buddy, goes in the water, finds the ring, and, and then he becomes Smeagol. And so there is a possibility that episode eight could start with a 21-year-old Kylo Ren coming, meeting, you know, Snoke at the 7-Eleven and, you know, offering to buy him <laughs> beer illegally or something like that. And then they become buddies. I don't know. So there's possible that sort of thing could happen. But as far as it being a full-fledged prequel, like the events in Episode 8 happened before the events of Episode 7, I, I don't think there's a chance in hell in that. Remember, part. kids, because having an older guy buy you beer at 7-Eleven is the start of the dark side. <laughs> How, like, what a mind fudge it would be, like, to, to, to have this entire movie take place before The Force Awakens. I read that question and I was like, oh my God, that would I, I don't necessarily want to see it happen, but the onions it would take for a Lucasfilm <laughs> and Disney to be like, yeah, yeah, we're not going to answer any of those questions yet. We're going to take you back a little ways and explain all this other stuff. I agree, a flashback could definitely be utilized. They played around with it with that Force flashback scene that Ray had in The Force Awakens. So there's a good chance that you could see something similar to that in Episode Eight. 
What do you, what do you guys call it? The Jedi Chronocron or whatever the Holocron. <laughs> Holocron. The Holocron. The, come yeah. on, Schnapp, get with it, man. So, hey, I know about comics. Not all things uh, Star Wars related. So all the Holocron. I mean, do they, they still have those after uh, you know the te temples are blown up. Those don't exist anymore, right? They're probably still uh, around somewhere. I'm just thinking, Relics. like you know, the Star Wars universe. They're not. Nobody's walking around with iPhones or videotaping stuff, but they must have some way of like. You know, capturing data. I wonder if they're going to have a sequence where they're watching a, an old, like fan, home movies or something. Like Leia's watching a, a scene with Han and the young, their young kid. They could be watching. They could. That's a way to th show a flashback. And this babysitter they hired once called Eddie Snoke. <laughs> and they're like, that was a mistake. I, I never trusted that Snoke. That was a mistake. And he's always weird. His white pastiness and the weird cut on his head. And he's always looming over our children. I never trusted him. <laughs> Sometimes he's a giant 500-foot hologram for no reason. I, I wouldn't mind seeing a There's flashback. There's been an awakening. That's right. Go back to bed. There's been an awakening in my pants. What? Um, <laughs> oh, this just got dark. Hey, man. It is the dark side. I don't want to see a flashback. Star Wars has never used flashbacks. They've done that weird, like, force, you know, ray kind of, like, vision. I'd like to see more of that kind of stuff. But once again, it's... Uh, Flashbacks aren't really in the Star Wars universe, but now I guess they're a force power, so who knows? Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? Jalen Thompson writes, after winning Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Picture at the Golden Globes, what do you think are the films, and to me, more importantly, Leonardo DiCaprio's chances of winning at the Oscars? I don't really think there's any correlation between what happens at the Golden Globes and then what happens at the Academy Awards. Remember this. And this is the key difference. The Golden Globes are voted on by the Hollywood Foreign Press. Now, what is the Hollywood Foreign Press? The Hollywood Foreign Press are a bunch of movie journalists who work for outlets that are based outside of the US, but they themselves happen to live in Hollywood or in Los Angeles. And it has a membership of about, I'm within 15 to 20, but I think around 60 people. Might be 70, might be 75, might be 55, but it's around 60 people. And that is the voting body of the Hollywood Foreign Press. Those are the people who make up the votes for the Golden Globes. It's a small group of people. The Academy Awards, however, are voted on by the Academy of Motion Arts, uh, Pictures, and Sciences. And that is a membership of around six to 7,000 people. So you can get a group of 60 people and say 41 you know, out of them think this way, but that would be an insignificant drop in the bucket in a voting base of six to 7,000 people. So look, I think on the 15th, we get the Academy Award nominations come out. I believe it is a lock that Leo DiCaprio gets nominated for Best Actor. And I believe he's got a 20% chance of winning Best Actor, but I would say like a 30% chance is going to Michael Fassbender right now. That's just the way I read the tea leaves, but who knows, maybe that could change. Um, so really, I don't, in seeing the results of the Golden Globes, those are nice and everything, but I don't think they're an indicator at all as to what we're going to get at the Oscars. That doesn't mean I think the Golden Globes got them wrong or anything like that, no, not at all. I just think when you look at the voting base size and who the voting body is and all that kind of stuff, you realize one really has not much to do with the other, so I don't think it really tells us anything about it at all. Schnepp, what do you think? I don't think it'd be that hard to do a Kickstarter and raise money to get those 70 Hollywood glo you know, Globe people, those press people to get into a, a, you know, maybe a theater and teach them what comedy is. <laughs> so it could be a two hour seminar. We could raise enough money on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, crowdsource it because we don't want to waste just the money. Just get Judd Apatow. Yeah, just get some, you know. In get, there. Get Ridley Scott in there and then maybe show them the duel. You know, it's like, it's like hey, you know, not the duel, um, the duelist, sorry. Hello we and show welcome them. to what comedy is. I'm yeah. Joy McClure. Yeah, you had Ricky Gervais, who's a comedian. He was the host. He did a show called The Office. That's comedy, you morons. Uh, I would like to see that happen. Leo, I hope you win. I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. Mark. Uh, well, the Golden Globes, if you're looking to prognosticate who might win the Oscars, the Golden Globes have never been as accurate an indicator as some other award shows like the SAG Awards or the Critics' Choice Awards. But having said all that, th this was a great ad for The Revenant last night. Yeah, I mean, When you drive yeah. around Los Angeles, you always see billboards of movies that are trying to position themselves to win Oscars. Like, oh, make sure for your consideration, check this movie out, check that movie out. The Revenant got a great boost last night because it wasn't just one award. Like, Kate Winslet won for, for, for Steve Jobs, but then The Revenant doing actor and director and best picture well, in a drama. Half of actor. 
half of actor. <laughs> it's still, it's a great, like... Matt it, Damon won the other half. But I don't know that Matt Damon, and I think he should be, I don't know that Matt Damon's even going to get nominated for Best Actor at the Oscars. Well, for and comedy. Think, Best comedy. I think that, well, I, unfortunately, <laughs> they don't have that category at the Oscars. They don't have made-up stuff just for, like, didn't Kate Winslet win for Best Comedy? Oh, that's right. No, they didn't, they messed up. They didn't get that. That's what they should do for, like, the three weeks prior ceremony when they have the Science and Technical and Comedy Awards. Hey, <laughs> here you right. go. Here's one, of, us here's one of the funny things, too. They have... Best motion picture drama, best motion picture comedy or musical, best actor drama, best actor uh, motion picture comedy or musical. But the supporting actors, yeah, just best supporting actor in a movie. <laughs> what they they, they, no, they don't get comedy? Nah. No, 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 no. It's not, it's, it's not that important. <laughs> we just wanted to get Jennifer Lawrence there, so we gave her this little you know, golden That's globe. That's pretty much it. How do you think yeah. the tourists got nominated yeah, that one year? I know. They wanted to get Angelina Jolie and Johnny Depp here. Money won't work. What about this golden globe? <laughs> and money. All right, folks, so well, that'll do it for our mailbag segment. And once again, don't forget, send in your mailbag questions to us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see it on Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on our mailbag shows on Saturday or Sunday. But now I said we would take a few minutes to take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Ashley, the Twitter sphere, I'm sure, is streaming like yeah. crazy. What have you picked out of the Twitters? <laughs> All right, Marcus Howard writes, what superhero or movie character would you want as your stepdad? <laughs> oh, as my stepdad? Good question. Definitely not Batman. No. You're making me work up. out all the time. You're too slow with your push-ups. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> um, who would be awesome to hang out with? As your stepdad. As yeah. Stepdad. stepdad Superman. Superman, why? No one's ever going to mess with you. Ever. Right. Like, Never. Ever, 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 in any level of school are you in? Well, that will the argument, the the eternal argument of my dad can take your dad. Yeah, that's gone. Right. That that thing's just out the window. Somebody giving you trouble at school. I'm gonna bring my stepdad just for a minute. It's it's just done. I wouldn't want to hang out with him necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but but you can feel pretty safe and secure that your stepdad, who married your loving mother, uh, apparently because he's your stepdad, you know she's in good hands, no problems, nothing's ever bad going to befall See, her. See, here's the issue with Superman as your stepdad, is that he can't bestow his powers and abilities onto you. Right. But if Tony Stark is your yeah, stepdad, dude. you get uh. all the billions of dollars that you would have had with Bruce Wayne without all those weird, I saw my parents get murdered when I was a kid, demons. Right. Plus, he can build you a tiny little Iron Man yeah. suit that you can fly around to. And then he's your stepdad. You don't want to necessarily hang out with him yeah. all that often. You can, sure, you go fishing with and Aquaman. And he can help you dad, pick up chicks. The, yep. the iron suit <laughs> yeah. is going to get you laid, kids. I promise it will. And he has an alcoholic problem at some point in time where you can actually join him and be the demon in the bottle. The younger <laughs> version. Dad, look at me. I'm doing shots. Too, stepdad. I think Iron Man's the winner on that one. Yeah, you're a, you're a billionaire with all the weird problems that you want, the problems that you want to have, not the problems you don't want to. Too have. much money, too many women, too yeah. many cool toys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mom, a, what's wrong with Tony today? Uh, he and Captain America had a meeting. Yeah. It didn't go well. Yeah, you're gonna have to take the Lambo and go to the. Oh, okay, uh, you know. All right, what's next? James Brown asks. Speaking of Zoolander two. Hey. Hey! Get on up. I got it. I got it. Get on up. Speaking of Zoolander two, are you surprised by the lack of marketing by the movie that comes out next month? Um, no, not really, because I think there's been a half decent amount of marketing for for rel this is going to be a relatively small comedy. Like this isn't a two hundred million dollar film. I thought there's already been a half decent amount of marketing, but also remember. I think strategically, I think it was me and Christian were talking about this. I think strategically they wanted to hold off until more of the Star Wars momentum died mm. down a bit. Yeah. And then they can, you know, Star Wars now going to be have its fourth week. They got Remember John Wick didn't even release its first trailer until 1 month before the release. And then it came out and got us a lot of us uh, interested. I think you're going to probably see in the next 4 to 5 days Zoolander to pick up the marketing steam a little bit now heading into the final month. And but as of right now I think it's been fine. Mark. I saw a casting for the some Zoolander promos, so I think that they're probably really? going to pick it up mm. now. Yeah. They're like asking like, "Ooh, hot sexy girl." So I'm sure you guys will see. So you some passed hot, along to Mark. Yeah, yeah. I there you go, Mark. Reply and <laughs> sent my headshot in. Uh, I saw an ad on TV. I think it was during the Golden Globes yesterday yeah. for Zoolander too. So you're starting to see more of those pop up, but it's got a really tough level of competition because if you're going up against Deadpool and the How to Be yeah. Single, which isn't a movie that necessarily appeals to me, but it's about four girls who I believe are single with, or they're in different phases of their lives. It's the perfectly made, probably made for Valentine's Day movie. Yes. So Zoolander two has a bit of an uphill battle. 
Well, I think it's, I mean, it's good counter-programming. It's, it's a comedy like Deadpool is a comedy, but it's not a superhero film like mm -hmm. Deadpool. So I think it's going to do really well. And just, I mean, from that one trailer that they dropped, which was hilarious, all they have to do is drop one more trailer that is just equal to or as funnier than that one. And, you know, that's a double feature weekend for me. That's Deadpool and Zoolander 2. I just don't know which one I want to see first, you know? And in the in, even in the TV spot, they did a very good job of showing us that, yes, it's Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson. They're mm -hmm. back. But you also have Penelope Cruz. Will Ferrell is going to be back. And they showed some of those star cameos, like the Justin Bieber thing that the we saw Justin in the trailer. The Justin Bieber bit is really <laughs> funny. Yeah. And, you know, and you knew it was going to happen as soon as when Owen Wilson says, hey, throw me the knife. I knew he's going to throw it to him and it's going to stick in him. And it happened and I laughed my ass off mm -hmm. anyway. So... Take that for what you will. All right, what's next? You guys are gonna like this one. Harry J. A. Killick writes, personally, I think Pixels is underrated. Why the hate? It's not great, but it's better than what people say. Nah. Oh, awkward. Yeah. Awkward. It, it's so awesome that I just haven't brought myself to see it yet. <laughs> I'm just waiting, maybe until I'm 70 and I have loose stool and I'm just like constantly uh, uh, um, on, you know, on hey. the toilet that I can't do anything but watch pixels hey look here's the thing i say this all the time all film subjective and if somebody out there that's the great thing about that's not a great thing that is the best thing about movies is that no matter what it is we all come to to art and that's what film is as an art we all come to art with different perspectives and different life experiences and it impacts us in different ways and that means there are going to be movies like pixel pixels that strike somebody in a good positive way and that's awesome and i celebrate the fact that you saw pixels and enjoyed it to me, it was a steaming pile of shit. <laughs> I mean, I mean that was, that's to me. But, to, but that doesn't diminish the fact that you had a good experience with it, and that's awesome. But if you're going to ask me the question, why do people trash talk on Pixels, it's because it's a horrible piece of garbage film. And it, was just, it wasn't funny. It wasn't, they, even the visual effects were bad. I mean, none of it made sense. See why I haven't seen it yet? At least make me <laughs> laugh. I don't, when, I, when I'm hanging out with my pals and they tell me stuff like that, I'm like, it's not even on a list that I've like, oh, I can't wait to not see that. It's not even on that list. It's just not on a <laughs> I list. I can't wait to it not just see it. It went away. Yeah, and but I didn't even, what did you think of Pixels? I, I, I thought it was such a miss. I, I didn't hate, hate, hate the movie, but it was the comedic opportunities that you had in there that they just didn't take advantage of, which is just a bummer to me. And like, Harry, think about it this way. Maybe you liked Pixels more than I did, but I think we can both agree that it didn't reach its potential with when you're talking about bringing back classic Nintendo and computer animated game kind of movie, and you have all those characters in this, and they're attacking us, and it's aliens using that technology against us. It's such a great premise for action and for comedy, and it just didn't live up to what it could have been. That's the biggest bummer of the movie to me. All right, let's take two more. All right, Unlimited Power writes, <laughs> when adjusted for inflation, Gone with the Wind is the highest grossing film at $3.44 billion. Will any film ever top this? Mm. Well, but look, we've, we've had this discussion before about adjusted for inflation. Yeah, but that only counts if you don't take into account the hundred other variables of socio and you know economic changes between the cultures of the time when that movie mm -hmm. came out and now you can't just reach in and pick out one variable that you want to say hey I have to make an adjustment to and then make that the standard there's a hundred different variables you'd have to take into consideration if you really want to do that and while it is not perfect the current system of simply straight down the board how much did this movie how much money did this movie make that's the one you have to go with because it kind of like I said, it's not perfect, but it kind of balances out all those other variables like competition. Uh, what what is the the current you know um, what is the average wage today? What is the how much how much uh, is competing for that entertainment? Was dollar? there television back then? Yeah. No. Were there other movies <laughs> yeah. in the theaters like, back then? How many other films were coming out every single week against right. it? Like you can't just say I'm going to pick inflation as my one variable and make that. You, you can't do that. That's there's no one north star when it comes to which variable it is and that's why we just stick with going right down the middle I don't know how would you dress but that? the question is on the table will a movie ever make 3.44 billion dollars do you think that that could possibly ever happen I mean we see what a tough time Star Wars is gonna have just crossing two billion dollars and that movie is a phenomenon like Avatar is 2.8 million dollars so you still needed 600 mil just to get to possibly that number you needed 200 more million just to break 300 or 3 billion so I don't know that you're gonna see that for at least you know another 20 years until 
you know, ticket prices get so out of control that we all stay home and watch it right. on our you know, whatever device we have that can let us watch. For I think you have to fill yeah. out a loan agreement at the ticket counter. That's <laughs> in that day. That right. maybe I think not within the yeah. next five years. I think certainly not no, within the next no. five years. Unless it comes that. with like head goggles, like virtual free VR egg that you get to wear <laughs> and you get to keep the egg, then I'll, I might do it. Um, I don't think anything's ever going to make three billion dollars. It'll be some synthesis that we don't. We're not some somewhere in the future in like five, ten years where movies and television are like you watch it in you know some super omni screen that everybody gets because you have the egg or whatever. You know, it's going to be something weird that we don't know about. But then all of us buy it for ten bucks all globally. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the, that's what I'm saying is it will be something that can be easily shared and that it can be easily done with like, everyone's got their little chip now. What the sign of the beast or whatever. You know, I'm not saying like chips like that. I'm saying, you know, it's like everyone has a credit card. It's like, it makes it very easy, a transaction. People will just swipe it on Amazon and then all of a sudden a billion people watched it and they spent $10. That's 10 billion bucks in one day. So it's like some kind of global screening type thing is the only way I could ever see $3 billion. Yeah, unless, unless George Lucas loves Daddy's Home and he decides to see it 500 million times. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the money, He's got a, the money to Just do imagine it. George Lucas in the theater just laughing his ass off like yeah. he's De Niro in the back of the theater in Cape Fear. Just cannot get enough of Daddy's Home. I want to see a thousand George Lucases like he cloned himself. So it's just him and his giant <laughs> jiggling neck like a, a thousand of them all. Like, <laughs> like laughing He's got at a lot Daddy's of free home. time. I want to see that happen. All right, last question of the day. Right, Max Russell writes, could Daisy Ridley be a young Laura Croft in Tomb Raider reboot? Ooh. Uh, you could say any name of any actress here, could she be a, a young, sure. I, I wouldn't put my money on it, but sure, it's a possibility. Yes, she'd be great. Yeah, why she, not? Yeah. She'd be great. Yeah, she 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 can pull A hundred other action. actresses would also be great, but yes, she would be great. No, it's Daisy Ridley, damn it. She's the only <laughs> Laura Croft I'm going to see. <laughs> I she, agree she's with She's got the, the natural accent for it. Yeah, she would be a great Laura Croft. Why not? All the, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. The final judgment goes to Dennis. Dennis, yay or nay. Ridley as uh, Daisy Ridley as Laura Croft. Yay. He yay. says yay. yay. So sayeth Dennis. So say we all. So Three say billion we dollar all. movie, right? Three there. billion dollars. Three movie, billion Daisy dollars. Ridley in the next Tomb Raider. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this Monday installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. And listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. My God, if you got a chance to see Star Wars The Force Awakens in the Prime Theater, by all means, go check out that Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime. It is an exceptionally good movie viewing experience. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You can find me burning some Golden Globes in the back alley somewhere in uh, Hollywood. <laughs> you won four, didn't you? Yeah, I won four of them and defaced all of them. And uh, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to tdoslwh.com. And today, listen to a whole bunch of David Bowie. And sitting over here, right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at the new Twitter handle. It's at Mark Ellis Live. That's also the website, MarkEllisLive.com. Thanks to all the Collider fans that came to see me in Baltimore at the Horseshoe Casino this past Friday. Upcoming dates include Nashville and Indianapolis. Get there. And of actually now trending, hashtag so saith Dennis. Of course, and sitting down <laughs> at the end, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And of course, you guys can follow me simply on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Cambia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.